going to read the scripture this morning. I'm uh, Edward Charles and my wife Rosemary. We've been members of Cedar Park Church for the past uh, four years or so. It's a pleasure to be here reading the Word of God with you. So we're reading from Exodus chapter 14, verses 5 through to 22. <coughs> when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about what they had said to them. What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost all their services. So he had his chariot made ready and he took his army with him. He took his 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with the officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Hariroth, opposite Baal Zepon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to, de to the desert to die? What have you done to us? in bringing us out of Egypt. Didn't you say in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will gain glory through the Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind them coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. This is the word of God. Amen. Well, I've uh, shared before about how I had gone to a beautiful country um, on a church missions trip. Missions trips are uh, how we kind of go and ex get exposed to how the Lord is working cross-culturally. And, and the country I've mentioned before where I've went, you've heard me talk about it, is John Pellin. It's your country. It's Guatemala, the beautiful country of Guatemala, filled with incredible active volcanoes and greenery. And yeah, it rains like it does here, but not as long. And the sun does come out almost every single day. Am I right, John? So like, it's a beautiful country filled with absolutely beautiful people. 
So we were there for a couple of weeks, and we were partnering with all kinds of local ministries. Just this a beautiful experience. But there was one day where, as we were leaving Guatemala City, where most of the people reside, and going down into the villages, we were getting away from the mountaintops, down kind of into the valley areas, and there was, uh, there we kind of saw raw Guatemala, right? We saw, we saw what like the landscape looked like, and so we're in these villages, and the locals wanted to take us to this kind of semi-famous area that was just a few miles away, and so we went to it, and what it was, was it was this incredibly beautiful waterfall that fed into this uh, into this swimming pool, like, a, like not a real swimming pool, but like a swimming hole, right? And uh, it, it just looked like anything you would see off of a movie, right? And so, and so we were loving it. You know, it's hot and sweaty. We'd worked all day, and we, going for a swim was incredible. Now, what made this uh, pool of water unique is that when you got into the water, it felt, you know, lukewarm to cool. But as you got closer to the waterfall itself, it started to heat up. In fact, when you were underneath of the waterfall, it was like legitimately hot, like a shower. And what we'd come to find out is that what fed into the waterfall up above the cliff was actually a natural hot spring. And so we climbed up it. It was so hot, I couldn't put my feet in it. The locals could, but I couldn't, right? It was scalded. And by the time it had traveled a few meters and then down, it had cooled just enough that it felt like a hot water. It was incredible. Like on one level, you've got cool water behind you. You've got hot water falling on top of you. But here's why the place was really famous. It's because directly behind the waterfall were caves. Now, very narrow caves. And these caves were, I would say, about 80% submerged under the pool water, right? You could barely just see the top of it, right? And so what some daring individual had once attempted to do and discovered is that you can actually swim into the cave and through the cave so that it brings you outside the other side of the rock wall. It'll take you about 30 seconds. Now here are the details. When you enter into the cave, it actually descends a little bit. And so within a few seconds, the only way to go through the cave is to fully submerge yourself underwater. Follow me? Secondly, it's pitch black. You cannot see a thing. Third thing, it's extremely narrow. One person at a time. And there are sections where you cannot swim. You have to grab the rocks and pull yourself through. And they're telling us, we've done this a ton of times. As long as you keep your cool, as long as you don't lose your head, as long as you keep moving, you will get through to the other side. And they were kind of encouraging us. Do you want to come? And I'm going, no, I don't want to come. I'll take your word for it. I'll watch you start to go in, and I'll watch you come out the other side. I believe the story. I bet it's incredible. I'll Google it later. But I, I don't know if I want to go in there. Because it's so narrow at points that you can't turn around if you lose your nerve, right? You try to turn around, you're stuck. You got to keep going if you're going to get yourself through to the other way. There are a couple adults in our group that actually built up the nerve to try and experiment this. But they would not do it unless there was someone going right ahead of them. They heard the stories, they saw people go through, but for some reason they needed to feel like, even though they couldn't see, even though they knew the stories, they needed to feel like someone was right ahead of them so that they could follow and get themselves through to the other side. Because unfortunately, if you don't have the nerve, what's going to potentially happen in your life is that the natural instincts of fear and, and just being anxious and scared might cause you to stall out and not get through to the other side. And I get it. Like, do you hear this story? Do, do some of you, like, right off the bat feel like you just had, like, an espresso shot? Because I do. Just talking about this story, just looking at this story, just, it, it builds the anxiety in me, right? Even though I know I could probably do it if I kept myself going, I don't want to go through that experience. I hate that kind of stuff. I don't like to be scared. I mean, yeah, like once in a while when someone pulls a trick on you and does a boo moment, yeah, it's hilarious and it's funny. But I'm, talk I'm, I'm talking more than just being like scared in an instant. I'm talking about living with something deep inside of you, in your fibers, in your fabric, that thing being fear. You know what I'm talking about? Fear, crippling fear, 
fear of the unknown, fear of what's around the other bend of the corner, like deep-seated fear. I don't like living with that. Do you like living with that? Is there any emotion besides maybe pain that is worse than the emotion of fear? Is there anything that's more crippling to your progress, to your health, to your goals than that of fear? Fear of what's coming. Fear of where you come from. Fear if you're accepted. Listen, this is an emotion we get all too well. I tell this story, and the reason in the back of our head can just give us just a glimpse, a slice of this kind of raw emotion, is because each and every one of us have lived through seasons where we know what it's like to metaphorically go into dark places, not sure where it's going to take us, not sure how long it's going to take us to get through the other side, and if allowed, we recognize that fear is naturally going to be there, and if we give in to that fear and stall out and stop moving, it's the kind of thing that can eventually drown us in our place. Fear is awful. Ugh, I hate fear. And yet, what I've discovered is, it is the number one, maybe the number one tactic of the enemy to at the very least stall you out of your spiritual growth. And then it turns into more than just your spiritual progress or your spiritual growth. It can keep you captured. It can keep you in place. It can actually cause you to na naturally descend backwards if it is not something that is thoroughly addressed or properly dealt with. Fear is powerful. And the earliest generals from the very beginnings of the war time when humanity started to assemble into groups and go against each other, they knew this all too well. Because the greatest battles that were won in human history was usually not just because one side was stronger than the other. No, what they used, the number one weapon they had at their disposal, was being able to instill fear in their opponents. And so there are stories of the Romans, and they're trying to conquer Great Britain, but by the time they get up to Scotland, where the Picts are, these are people who have bagpipes, ancient bagpipes. What is that noise? They thought they were dragons. And they painted their face, and they were crazy. They would cut themselves before they went into battle. They would literally instill fear in the greatest military power the world had ever seen to that point. And here's how they won the day. It was not by brute force. It was when they could give such fear into the opposing side that they would turn their backs to the enemy, tuck tail, and run. When you tuck tail and go the other way, when you tuck tail and run, you are a sitting duck. And that's how battles were won and battles were lost. Right up until this current time, when you really think about it. That's what fear does. It's an awful reality. It could cause you to retreat. And unfortunately, it's not something, just something that we've lived with for many of us in this room. If we're being brutally honest with ourselves, it's something we're living with to one way, shape, or form today. Your health, your physical, emotional, mental health has you in a place of fear, and it stalled you out. Your resources or lack thereof has you wondering how you're going to make end meets ends meet, and uh, fear has kind of stalled you out. Key decisions you're facing, your prospects, your kids, your grandkids, deadlines, how you're perceived, whether that risk will pay off, all of these things, and there are so many more other areas in our lives where fear can get deep inside, underneath of us, and grip us to such a degree that we stall out or are tempted to turn backwards and run away. And when we do, we are sitting ducks for the enemy whose purpose it is to seek, kill, and destroy you and your family. And that's what we want to look at today because I believe the scriptures have a key antidote. And I'm going to tell you straight off the bat, on the surface, it's going to seem so simple, it's going to see, seem so uh, basic that you just like I've heard this before Chris there's nothing profound about it and yet I'm not sure that we've really come to understand it to the point where we believe it where we embody it so we've been in this series for the past four weeks on Psalm 23 and every one of these messages we've been kind of picking apart this psalm that's only six verses long and looking at it one verse at a time we've looked at this psalm because it's probably the most timeless psalm out there, right? Literally, yesterday, I had to perform a funeral for a family, for a family member who had died tragically, um, and, and, 
and, and didn't know the Lord, and really who I was talking to was the rest of the family, and the text I used was one that was semi-familiar to people who don't go to church, who don't really have a faith. It's Psalm 23. It's the one that seems to be universal and timeless, and there's a reason why it's so beloved. There's a reason why it's known. is because in this short poem, in six small verses, it tends to encapsulate every human emotion that you and I will go through in a season of life. But it also offers a way through toward flourishing. It shows the direction. It shows the how. And so we've been looking at every verse one by one and being attached, uh, also attaching another biblical story to it to help us kind of flesh it out. Today, we're at the halfway point. And uh, right in verse 4. And uh, this is going to be talking about how how, like, when life brings us to certain places where it's not up and to the right, when, when life brings circumstances that are difficult, when we're experiencing natural, natural fear and causing us to question our, our most profound realities and our, our most solid truths and our most solid experiences, it can cause us to bring into question whether or not the Lord is even really there in our lives. Have you been there, church? Have you been in a low place? Have you been in a place where experiences are just coming at you one after another? Have you experienced the health? Have you experienced just the transitions that are difficult in life? Have you experienced heartbreak that has caused fear to seep in where you actually begin to question your very faith? Lord, are you there? Why aren't you listening? Are you in control? Are you still talking to me? Well, good news for you, church, because Psalm 23 is going to address that directly, and I'm here to tell you that it's a resounding yes. So here's what it says. Psalm 23, first four verses. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. But here's the big one. Even though I walk through the darkest valleys... I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I like the way the King James says it. This is one of those times. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Four words. You are with me. The valley, it's real. The darkness is there. (laughs) <laughs> doesn't even deny evil in this text. No one wants that in their life. No one wants that surrounding them. But where it lands at the end of the verse is where it wants you to put your attention, the reader. You are with me. What is the thing that makes the difference? How can the sheep fear, even though everything around them should produce dread? Why is this universally known as a psalm of comfort when these words are in there? It's those four key words. You are with me. Church, do you know this? Do you remember it? Have you come to experience it? The Lord is for you. Maybe you haven't heard that before. Maybe you haven't heard that in a while. Maybe no one in your life is giving you that experience right now. People have let you down. But I got good news for you. We serve a crucified Savior who rose from the dead all because he is for you. And because he is for you, you can rest assured he is with you. He's with you. So are you in a dark valley right now? Good news. He's with you. Yeah, he's with you when you're in the still waters. He's with you when you're lying quietly, when things are all really good. But when you really need to know that he's there, when you feel the oppression, when the uncertainty, when the risks, when there is someone or something out there looking to consume you or take you down, church, You need to remember he is with you. But I'll be honest with you. Even your pastor forgets this sometimes. Sometimes the darkness, it can feel really potent. It can feel really strong. Which speaks to why fear is such a powerful emotion. It can rob us of the awareness of God's very presence. And it tends to direct our attention to the source of fear rather than the source of comfort and deliverance. 
It's why this Exodus story Charles read was it's just so powerful, right? It is universal. It's why it is so loved. We understand all too well what it would be like to be an Israelite in this story, right? You have come through. You have, you have dread headed your way. Like dread is maybe the most, most potent word I can use to describe what they might be feeling. It is more than being scared. It's more than being fa- having a little bit of fear in your life. You've got the water on this side and the enemy on that side, and you've got no weapons to protect yourself. It's a surefire thing that if the Lord does not show up for you, you are about to experience the worst thing you can experience. That's dread. That's when it absorbs into you, when you want to die. That's what the Israelites are experiencing in this moment. And the story is remarkable. I love the Exodus story. Next, next to the Gospels, I think this is probably the most important passage in, in all of Scripture. Here you have the Israelites who for hundreds of years had been slaves in Egypt. The Lord shows up. He wants to take this formerly enslaved group of individuals and form them into a nation. The purpose of that was so that they could bring redemption to the world and point to who the one true God is. And so what's going to happen? The Lord is going to expose Egypt's gods as nothing but counterfeit gods. He's going to bring plagues upon them. He is going to judge them for their oppression and their wickedness. And because of his strong and mighty arm, he is going to deliver the slaves from what was the greatest empire the world had seen up to that point. So the, the people for weeks, maybe months now, have seen the Lord do this. We read this because we're on the other side. We think, come on, Israel. You just saw him turn the Nile to blood. Did you see the lice and the frogs and the darkness and, and the Passover? Right? Like, you saw it. But that doesn't matter when you're at the river's edge and the army is on their way to come toward you. And here in this moment, they, they are fearful, and they react accordingly. I love the text. It tells us that Egypt, after a few days, when they had finally told the Israelites, get out of here, go, take your stuff and get out of here, that Pharaoh comes to his senses. He wakes up and he goes, what did we do? We let go of our workforce. We let slaves defeat us. So in that moment of clarity, after he's had a few moments to grieve the death of his own son, he mobilizes forces because he's angry. The Bible tells us he mobilized 600, his entire chariot force. Now, here's the funny thing about this story. 600 chariots is way too many chariots to mobilize to go against the slaves. Chariots were the ancient equivalent of missiles. The Israelites have nothing They don't have anything to arm themselves. They are sitting ducks. They could have taken a fraction of this force and gone and done the job. Why does he mobilize every? I think he wants them to see in the distance. Wave after wave after wave of the enemy coming their way. Isn't that just the way life is like sometimes? I don't know about you, but you've heard the expression, when it rains, it pours. Oh, my goodness. I find that when I'm in seasons where it feels dark, when I don't know up from down, when I don't know why I feel anxiety the way I do, when I feel the fear coming deep inside me, it's like a domino effect. It's just wave after wave after wave, and you finally go, Lord, I can't take any more of this. Well, that's what the Israelites do. See, we criticize the Israelites quite often because later on in the Exodus and Numbers story, they're going to complain to God over and over again. And there is definitely a point where that crosses a line. I don't actually think it crosses a line here. Because the Israelites, by going to Moses to complain here, they're really going to the Lord, aren't they? They're really saying, did you bring us to the desert here to die? It'd be better if we'd stayed slaves. Now notice here, the Lord does not chastise the Israelites for this motion here. Because in their dread and in that moment, the only thing they can do is call out. But watch this. At least they call out. And, and church, can I just tell you something? There will be time. Listen, I want you to develop a faith and a trust in the Lord through your experiences that when seasons like this come, 
no matter what the, Lord, what the world may throw at you, no matter how people might try to destroy you or bring you down, I want you to have a faith that as you see wave upon wave coming, you can just say, I trust the Lord. But let's be honest, that ain't automatic. That doesn't happen without experiences. So if you're in a place right now and you're experiencing fear, you're experiencing dread, you need something to happen to bring you through to the other side. The Lord I serve has big enough shoulders for you to bring even your complaints to him, but go to him. Because this is what we do when fear comes our way. We go inside of ourselves, don't we? When I'm down, when I'm depressed, I don't want to talk to my wife about it. I just want to kind of go into myself. I want to be alone. I want to wallow in it. And I find that it starts to compound on top of me. Church, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I don't want to be a complainer. I want to honor the Lord. But listen, there are t- listen, church, I'm, I'm giving you permission. Can't stay in that place forever. But if you're so overwhelmed that the only thing you can say to the Lord is, where are you? You said you'd be there. You're not. I don't feel you. Do it. When I went through my burnout, which I've expressed a number of times, I went through a period of months where I couldn't hear from the Lord. I've just been a pastor. I'm the one who tells people how to connect the dots from the scripture. And you know what I was saying? God, where are you? I feel like I've lost myself. And I wish I could tell you it was an automatic process. (laughs) It wasn't. But eventually, the sun did rise. Eventually, I did feel his leading. And I can now look backwards and see what he was doing in me and developing in me so that I could develop a different level of trust. Church, really, this is an issue about perspective, isn't it? Is do you trust him? Do you really trust him? Can I tell you something? When you complain, when you go to the Lord and you say, hey, Lord, I just need you. I don't feel you. That's legitimate. That's in bounds. The Lord wants you to go to him, but he doesn't want you to stay there. There's a time to pray, and there's a time to move. And so Moses, when he goes to the Lord, he says this phrase that is expressed 300 other times throughout scriptures in different ways, shape, or form. He says, fear not. Now, why does that make a difference? I believe this. When the Lord says something, it is more than just an expression. The Bible tells us that the way he created the universe was what? Through his word. Let there be light. There's light. John 1.1, when it's describing Jesus as the incarnate what? Word of God. There is power when the Lord speaks. And when he speaks it over you directly, and when you hear it and receive it and absorb it, that's a game changer. So he said, I love this text. For a minute, he tells them to be still. He says, fear not. It's the same thing that happens when John, the book of Revelation, sees the risen Christ and he falls down to his face. When Jesus is walking on the water during the storm and the disciples are going, we're going to drown. Fear not. It's the same thing when Moses is commissioning Joshua to go lead the people into the promised land. Be strong and courageous. You know what that Hebrew translation of that is? Fear not. (laughs) Fear not. Then he says this. Watch. Be watchful. See what I'm going to do. So, when we hear the word of the Lord, when we put our perspective on him, then he invites us at some point to make movement. The movement may seem unnatural. It may seem like we have to artificially make our limbs go. But when you move across dry land, when he's doing the miracle in your life, he will bring you through the other side. 
And it's why we relate it to this whole psalm about the good shepherd, right? Because the shepherd, he leads you when things are good, but he also, at times and in seasons, has to lead you through valleys. Shepherds in the Middle East tell us this, that during the summer, the hot months, they have to go up into the mountains, they have to go up into the hills, they have to go where, you know, the snowfall is starting to recede because that's where there is still actually, you know, grass for the uh, sheep to be able to consume. And so for most of the summer months, they're up on the highlands. That's where they can roam. That's where they can really flourish. But you know that after the summer comes the autumn, eventually comes the winter. What comes with the winter is the snow. And as the snow starts to come, it starts to push the sheep downward, downward, downward. And the shepherd has no choice but at times to lead them through valleys. And the problem with valleys is there are flash floods. There's avalanches. There's predators. There are bandits. It's a risky situation. In fact, this is when shepherds have to do their most intense work. It's when they lose the most amount of sleep. It's when they have to watchfully take their sheep carefully from one point to the other through the valley so that they can bring them to the other side. This is where the sheep are most intimately with their shepherd. It is in a time when they need deep protection. And here is what you need to know that when you're in the valley of the shadow of death, when you're experiencing fear, he is with you, but it's an opportunity for you to be with him and to lean into him. Because for some reason, when we're in these experiences, we're just tuned in to hear his word differently, aren't we? The greatest seasons of spiritual growth have not come necessarily when things are hunky-dory in my life. It's when I need the Lord, when I don't know where I'm going to come out the other side, where I don't know where the provision is going to come, where I feel like the enemy is throwing one arrow after another at me. What do I need? I need someone to point the way and to speak to me the whole way. Fear not. And hey, don't look at that. Don't look at the shadow. Don't, don't look at that. Don't look at me. Watch what I'm going to do. Follow. Hear my voice. Follow. Follow. You know where else you hear the word follow? When Jesus goes and he's assembling disciples. He says, hey, follow me. Follow me. And we do church every Sunday. But fundamentally, the call of the Christian is the call of a disciple is to hear the good shepherd say, follow me. I don't know where you're at right now. And I, w I so wish for some of us here today, because I know there's got to be some people here today who are experiencing fear, and you're feeling that crippling effect, and you're feeling the anxiety, and you're having a hard time breathing. And I want you to hear me, because we are family here. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. It is not that simple when you're going through every day, but, but I want you to hear this because we've experienced this in our own lives and in our own seasons. He is a good shepherd. He is for you. He is with you. And if you listen to his voice, he will see you through to the other side. I want you to hear this as well. Because we're family, we want to carry the burden with you. We've got your back. We're here for you. He's a good shepherd. He loves you but we have to recognize his presence with us. And so I'm going to um, actually transition us into a wonderful representation of what that looks like because we're going to end our service today before the band leads us in one last song. And Karen, I'm going to actually invite you to come up on the piano, but um, we're going to take part in the Lord's Supper today. Um, the Lord's Supper is more than just a ceremony that we do. It's more than just kind of this thing that once a month we get together and eat bread and juice and remember what Jesus did for us, that there's a symbolic, very potent presence of Jesus Christ represented in these symbols. And so as some of the elders are coming up and distributing the elements to you, and I'll invite them up right now to come and start distributing, um, I invite you that you hold on to those elements together and really take the time to reflect on what it means that in this bread and in this cup, the Lord Jesus is with you. I can't explain it. I don't have all the details, but he's with you. 
when things are good, if you're lying in wonderful meadows, if you're by still waters, he brought you there. If you're going through the valley right now, church, oh, he's with you. So take some moments as we reflect on Santos. Would you come up here? Barbara, would you come up here? Yeah, thank you. We're going to invite the band to come and lead us in one last song. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're our ever-present help in times of trouble and need. Lord, we thank you that richness and life and goodness and blessing can be found ultimately in you that you to satisfy the deepest longing of our heart to know you and to be known by you. But Lord, we also thank you that when seasons of shadow come, when we're in the valleys of life, when we feel wave after wave of dread coming our way, Lord, as much as we want to escape them, as much as we want to sidestep them, Lord, we thank you that you are a solid rock, on which we can stand. And we thank you, Jesus, that you still call your sheep to hear and know your voice intimately and to follow you. Lord, we pray that we would have just what we need to be able to watch you and see you and know when you're beckoning us to watch what you're going to do in our lives and when you call us to move forward in spite of the fear, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are watchful, that you love us, and that you are ever present with us. And we pray, Lord, that we would continue to be individuals who trust you deeply and form our identity in knowing and obeying and following you, the Good Shepherd. We pray this in your name. Amen. And amen.